Hallelujah. Come on, let's give God the praise. Oh, come on, where you at, family? Where are the Levites? The sons and daughters? Oh, come on, let's give God the praise. We can do better than that. Let's lift up a shout of praise unto our King. Let's lift him up. Let's lift him up. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we glorify you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we welcome you into this place. Lord, we welcome you, Lord God. We are your broken vessels. Come on. Come on and praise him. You desire to abide in the praises of your people. Come on. So we lift our hands and we lift our hearts as we offer up the praise unto your name. Oh, so we lift our hands, yes, and we lift our hearts. Come on, lift them. As we offer up this praise unto your name. Come on, lift up to him. Hallelujah. Come on, y'all. Are you ready to lift up the name of Jesus? Yes. Clap your hands. Come on. I'm excited because God is about to do big things. Come on, I got a message for you. Come on. Feel big. Listen. The problem. The problem may be. Come on, he's in control. He's in control and he knows everything. We got the victory. I have the victory for he is my king. In him I live and move. In him I live, move, and have my name. Sin no matter what. No matter what. No, no, no. The problem may be. He's in control. He's in control. Come on, and he knows. He knows everything. He got the victory. I have the victory for he is my king. In him I live and move. In him I live. Come on, sing it out. Let the people. situation he's in control, he's in control. And, he and he knows, knows everything. everything i got the victory i have the victory for he is my king in him i live and move in him i live move one more time sin no matter what no matter no, what no. The be. come on he's in control he's in control and he knows everything i have the victory, have the victory for he is my king
God, we lift you up because you are the source of our strength, oh God. You are the strength of our life, Lord. We bless your name, Lord God. We ask that you would just come and rest here, Lord.
Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you for your strength. We thank you, oh God, for your peace. We thank you for your hope. We thank you, oh God, that you are a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper. You are our light in the darkness. You're more than enough or oh, sufficient. Do you believe that tonight? Come on and sing this with us. Hallelujah. Continue to worship him. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you, Lord. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Lord, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. We call you Waymaker, Miracle Work, Promise Key, Light in the Darkness, my God. That is who. Worship him. We worship I you, worship Lord. You. you are here. 
that is who you are. When your faith is wavering, you, you have to say, Waymaker, you're a miracle worker. Lord, I don't know what's going on. I don't know where I am. I, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, but you're a promise keeper. You keep your promises. Yes. You're not a man that you should lie. Yes. That is who you are. Come on, last time we say, We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Thank you, God. Thank you, oh God. We welcome you today to our Christian Cultural Center Lent experience. And our prayer is that God will continually bless you during this time of prayer and fasting, that you will grow in leaps and bounds, and the fruits of the Spirit of God and the gifts of the Spirit of God will manifest themselves in your life so that you can know for sure that God is moving, not only for you, but with you. Hallelujah, praise God. My theme today for this Lent service is preparation. Preparation, preparing ourselves to receive the best that God has and the best that he wants to give. Abraham Heschel speaks in his book called The Prophets of the Divine Pathos of God. That's God using the prophets to speak into men's lives. God being involved, God being in tune, God helping to shape, make, and mold those individuals upon whom he has put his hand how he is engaged on a daily basis in our lives. And I'm gonna share with you today, my scripture reference is coming from the Psalms, 51st division of Psalm, and it will read from verse one through 17. But before I can go to that particular portion of scripture, I need to give you some background on how and why David wrote this particular portion of scripture. And we, we find in 2 Samuel in the 11th chapter that it speaks of David during a time when kings would go to war and how he sent his army out to fight the Amorites, but he stayed home. He stayed home and just basically was chilling. The scripture says that he walked around on the roof of his palace. And from that position on the roof, he was able to look down into the house of Bathsheba, who was the wife of one of his men of valor, one of his fearless men who fought honorably for David and for the people of God. He looked down, the scripture says, and he saw her bathing and he was taken by her beauty. And he sent word that someone should bring him some information, bring him her name, bring her, her, her uh, whatever they could bring him concerning this woman who he's now been enamored with. 
smitten by because he was looking when he should have just seen but not looked. And so word came back to him that this is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. And David went a step further and he said, bring her to me. And they brought Bathsheba to David. And the scripture says that David slept with her. But you know what? When we enter into sin, we always get a little deeper than we expected. We always go a little further than we expected. And Bathsheba sends word back to David and says, David, I'm pregnant. So David sends for Uriah to come back from the battle, to come home. He brings him home and he dines him and, 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 and encourages him to uh, take a rest, take it easy, you know, go home. And he's trying to get him to go home and sleep with his wife so that this indiscretion, this, this sin of adultery would not become known. But Uriah wouldn't do that. <clears throat> Uriah slept outside the palace. And when David got word that Uriah didn't go home, he called him in and wanted to know, why, what, 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 what are you doing? You, 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 should, you should take it easy and rest and, 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 and go home and enjoy a good meal and enjoy your wife. And, and Uriah says, I can't do that. Well, the, the, the other men were out in the field fighting when Joab, the general, was out there and the boys that I am out there fighting with, I, I, I can't do that. Go home and experience creature comforts and experience my wife while they're still in the field. And David says to him, well, I'll tell you what, stay another day. Stay another day. And David plies him with liquor, gets him drunk, and thinks, well, now he'll go home. But he didn't. He went outside the gate and he and he slept there. And when David saw that his plot to cover up the sin had been foiled, he sends Uriah back to the battle, but he sends him with a note. He tells him to give this note to Joab. In his deceitfulness, he has given Uriah's own death warrant to carry himself to give to Joab. And it said, put Uriah in the midst of the fiercest battle. And when the battle is going on fiercely, withdraw. Withdraw, leave him there that he might be killed. And so he does that. And the word comes back, Uriah is dead. David thinks that he can go on with life without this sin being known, it being covered up, it being hidden. But God speaks to the servant of God, the prophet, Nathan, and tells him, go to David and tell him this story. And he went to David and he told David, what if there were two men? One was rich, had everything. One was not rich, had very little. One had much cattle, and land, and wives, and riches, and, and the other only had a, a little lamb that he cared for. And, uh, and, and the rich man decided to, to, to not to, to kill his lamb or his source of food to have a party for his people. He takes the poor man's lamb and takes it and kills it and has a feast with it. And David becomes enraged. Well, that son of a gun, he ought to be, he ought to be killed. He ought to be put to death. And Nathan says to David, you're that man. God said, I gave you all that you had. I gave you riches. I gave you land. I gave you 
wives. I gave you, I, 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 I gave you everything you could possibly want. And here you are. You had plotted to take what belonged to Uriah and literally were complicit in his murder. God, you see, the pathos of God is God's willingness to interject himself in the midst of your nonsense, my nonsense, because he loves us and he wants to do so much for us and with us. You see, God could have just let David go on thinking he had gotten away. God could have let David go on thinking he had covered over and covered up his sinfulness. But God sent word to him via the servant of God to let him know your sin is known. It is known. What is done in the dark comes to the light. And you see, the important part that I'm trying to share with you, and I'm going to read what David wrote after he had this confrontation with Nathan and came to, to know that God knew where he was and what he had done, and yet, yet through this divine pathos of God, reached out to him anyway. Because you see, as we prepare ourselves for this fast, as we prepare ourselves to, to get all that we can get, all that we should get out of this time being alone with God, we need to recognize that God is aware, acutely aware. And the beginning of any season of fasting and prayer ought to begin with repentance. It ought to start with us coming and laying ourselves bare before God and acknowledging no matter what your title, no matter what your position, no matter what your gifting, no matter how grand you are, no matter how well respected you are, there are things in our lives that we think nobody else knows and nobody else may never know. But God knew that this unconfessed sin would come before him on the day that David was judged by God and God was giving him an opportunity to clear the slate. Psalms 51, beginning at verse 1, David wrote this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. See, David came to a revelation and it's one that we all need to come to at some point in time. He recognized that it wasn't Bathsheba that he sinned against, though he committed her and, 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 and drew her into adultery. It wasn't, it wasn't Uriah who he had murdered that he had sinned against. He realized, it is you, God, who I have sinned against. And we have to come to that point and that place where we recognize that. We've got to be able to shed our preconceived notions, our prejudices, our, all those things. It, it's, not, it's not that brother or that sister who you are having ought with that you are sinning against. It's God who you are sinning against. It's not that brother or sister who you are interjecting yourself into the midst of their relationship and into their life that you are sinning against. You are sinning against God. It's not that, that hatred and that prejudice that you have towards the, 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 the Republicans or, or towards the Democrats or, 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 or towards the... It, it's God's order that you are in conflict with. If we come to realize and recognize in our lives that the things that have a hold on us, the thing that the enemy puts up in our lives, that... That, that, that we begin to, 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 to take a perspective and a, 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 
uh, uh, insight on that does not come from God is a sin against God. And if we will put it in its proper perspective, we will be prepared to reap benefits of our time with God. Don't hide over those things. Don't put them under the, uh, uh, under the blanket like they cannot be seen and they cannot be known. For they are clearly known and clearly seen. Jealousy, envy, hatred, all of these things are sins against God. You may think you have a clear and a clear cut reason why you can hold that ought against your brother or your sister. You can hold them in a position and in a place that you believe they deserve to be smitten. They deserve to get that, 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 that judgment that, that, that they deserve. But, but God tells us, you, you don't laugh at the calamity of someone. You pray for them. And if you want to really get something out of this time of preparing to lay before God in this time of fasting, put it in your heart to let stuff go. That hidden stuff. That stuff that nobody may ever know. But God knows. God knows. And I'm talking to you. But you know what? I'm talking to me too. Because nobody escapes. Nobody is perfect. And nobody has all of their ducks in a row and nobody has all of their godly perspective in order. We all have issues. But I'm telling you, Lay them at the altar before God. Ask him, even as David is asking him. He goes on and he says this in the sixth through the ninth verse. He says, even though I've been born in sin and I've been shaped in iniquity, and even though you know me and you know my thoughts and you know how I perceive things, how I receive things, how I look at things, he says, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. David had tapped into something. He tapped into a true relationship with God. But he had to lay down. He had to lay down his own sense. His own sense of majesty and glory. He had to stop reading his own press clippings about how great he was, about how much he had accomplished, about who he was the king above all kings, the slayer of giants, the ruler over mighty men of valor. He had to put that all down and put it in perspective when he saw himself in the light of this holy God who sees and knows everything. And it's a call to you and I to say, don't be so caught up in who you are and what you're doing. But if you want to really get into what God has preparing for you, and he is preparing great things, my brother and my sister. He is preparing great things. His anointing on our lives can accomplish more in five seconds than you can of begging and pleading and conjoling and and conniving and trying to. uh, You can spend years doing that to get folks to move to your perspective and your point of view. But you can have five
five seconds in the anointing, under the anointing of God, in the presence of God, in the favor of God, in the love of God, that God can speak through you. And a word spoken through you in season can bind the enemy, can break down walls of petition, can throw down enemies. All of his reasoning. And we want to get there. We want to be there. We want to have power with God. We want to have the enemy shaking in his boots. When you walk in a room, praise God, you want to have every spiritual entity and power that has come and aligned itself together and come to try and bring turmoil into the midst of the gathering of God's people. You want them to be shaking in their boots. Why? Because you are there. Because you have walked in. Because you have power with God. Because you have the ability to recognize, to discern, to see, and to know when he is in the midst and when he's moving and what he's trying to do. And you have the ability to call it that thing that doesn't look like it is, but it is. Psalm 51 verse 10 says this, okay, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. After what he has done, after what he has done, after what God has revealed about who he has allowed himself to denigrate to how he could how he could come become so low in this sin against his own men and God himself but yet he knows who his help comes from his help comes from the lord and he says lord hallelujah create in me your heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me, a steadfast spirit within me. Lord, I don't want a spirit that has me just jump and shout when the, when, when the anointing gets high. I don't want a spirit within me that just is, 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 is overjoyed when the blessings of God are flowing. Lord, I don't want a spirit within me that just uh, 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 has a shout. I want a steadfast spirit that is steadfast. It stands through the trial. It stands through the tribulation. It stands through the, 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 the persecution. It stands. It stands up when everyone else takes flight. It stands up. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. Lord, I know I'm human. And I can get caught up in human stuff. I know I can be prone to make mistakes. I know I don't always see the perspective as you would have me to see it. I know my decisions aren't always what they ought to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But Lord, all I ask is you do not cast me from your presence, for in your presence is the fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are blessings and pleasures forevermore. If I can come into your presence, Lord God, hallelujah, if I can just be allowed to come into your presence in spite of all of that stuff that weighs me down and tries to overwhelm me and overcome me, I can shake it off. I can shake it off. I can reach up and reach out and touch you, Lord God. You aren't here on earth anymore, but I can reach the hem of your garment. I can just as well see it, feel it, touch it as though, Lord God, you are right here, right now. And still that virtue, that power can flow right out of the hem of your garments, right through to my life and in my circumstances. So don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Forgive me. Forgive me. 
and restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. That's what we want, my brothers and my sisters. As we go to God during this time of Lent and sacrifice, praise God. We want to shed everything, every weight, everything that so easily besets us. And we want, praise God, hallelujah, to be given a willing spirit to sustain us. And then finally, David writes, then, then, in this renewed position, in this renewed condition, in this new place that you have placed me, Father, hallelujah. He says, then, in the 13th verse, then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. If I get in the right place that I need to be, my God, my songs of Zion will flow from my lips. And when ears hear them, they will not just hear the music and the words, but they'll experience the anointing. They will experience the yoke-breaking anointing of God wherever you are, whether you're in your home, whether you're in your car, whether you're on the job. You may not even sing as gloriously as our worship team does. You might have... Praise God, hallelujah, a voice that is more noise than music. But if you are singing and the anointing of God is on your life and the presence of God is on you, you can sit right there in your own home and sing the glorious melodies that have come from heaven and people in your household, in your home, your neighbors that are listening and hear through the wall or through the ceiling or hear through the floor below you can be by the glory of God that is exuding out of the depth of your innermost being. Why? Because I have a willing spirit and I have been sustained by God and his anointing is upon my life. Open my lips, Lord, the scripture says, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, you, God, will not despise. Praise God. Prepare yourself for what God is about to do. This time has been set aside for him. And he will do great and mighty things. You may be listening and you may not have your own personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to take this moment to invite you to receive him. He can come into your life and do all the things in you that we have read David has asked for in in his life. So if you'll just bow your hearts with me in the presence of God where you are right there. I know his anointing is right there where you are, where you are listening, where you are sitting. You just bow your hearts with me and just pray this simple prayer with me. And God will do something that all of hell cannot stop. And all of heaven will rejoice because you have embraced his son. Just pray with me. Father, I thank you. And I praise you for this opportunity to be freed from all the bondages of my life. All the bondages, known and unknown, natural and spiritual, ancestral, praise God, and peer orchestrated. I thank you, Father, for being free. 
I thank you that Jesus came, bled, and died for me. He came into my life right now, this moment. He's coming into my life, and I'm being cleansed. Being cleansed. Cleansed from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. Thank you, Lord. I want to love you, Jesus, more than anything because I know that you love me more than anything. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior and my soon coming King. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for the work you are doing in me, for the growth that's taking place in me, for the life, Lord God, that is beginning to exude out of me, to change me and everything around me. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. I thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Go on, y'all. Sing that. into the family of God. Jesus said it's so simple that a wayfaring man, though he were a fool, he could not err from it. There's a telephone number on the screen that you can text or you can call and say, I prayed that prayer. And there will be someone there to pray with you. We'll send you some material that will help you to grow. Those of you that are already in Christ Jesus, continue to press toward the mark of that high calling that is in Christ Jesus. Trust him. Trust him. Because no matter how hard it's been, it gets better. God is going to take you higher. And he's going to do exceedingly abundantly beyond that which you are able to think, ask, or even imagine. God bless you. Praise God. Let's say something together as we leave this place for never God's presence. Jesus is Lord, period. We believe it, we proclaim it, and we're seeing it come to pass. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Praise God. Go ahead, y'all.